year was 1939, America was on the verge of entering another world war. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. The Depression was still an everyday reality with jobs and opportunities hard to find. Gone with the Wind won the Academy Award for Best Picture. And in college football, the Texas A&M Aggies won the national championship. Military tradition and pride were nothing new to A&M in the 1930s. Officers would be needed for the war effort, and Aggies would be there to stand ready to defend freedom and democracy. College Station was a small town. Everybody knew each other. A group of close-knit friends that had a common bond. They were Aggies. 6,395 students, 399 teachers, and 55 football players all resided at the Agricultural and Mechanical College. The cadet meals were eaten at Sabisa Dining Hall, the largest dining facility under one roof in the world. Athletes dined in the new Duncan Dining Facility on the new South Campus. The football players were described by a Life magazine reporter as rugged, rangy, and rough. They have huge forearms, ham hands, and look like storybook Texans. Their coach, Homer Norton, began building this group in 1937 when he went about recruiting 40 of the best players they could find. $25,000 was appropriated for scholarships, and it was up to Lil Dimmitt to bring them to campus. 37 were signed, and eight more came from the core ranks for a total of 45 players, and the foundation was set. 1939, this group of players, seasoned by daily workouts with Captain Bubba's Blue Boys, went to work on a season that would go down as the greatest in Aggie football history. The Aggies began in Oklahoma City in a game against Oklahoma A&M. The Aggies dominated play from early on, leading 19 to nothing by the half. A 50-yard punt return by Bill Kanatzer for a touchdown, and dominating line play figured into the first win of the season with a final score of 32 to nothing. The centenary gentlemen came to Kyle Field for the first home game of the season. Aggies watched Jaron, John Kimbrell, rumble over the gentlemen defenders for two touchdowns. A&M's defense was impregnable. They did not allow the gents to cross the Farmers' 40-yard line all afternoon. Final score, A&M 14, centenary nothing. In two games, Norton's boys had not been scored on. The 2-0 Aggies took to the field next in San Francisco to face a tough Santa Clara squad. This team had beaten the Aggies the year before in a close 7-0 contest. A scoreless first half proved that this game, too, would go down to the wire. A&M fell behind when Santa Clara kicked a field goal in the third. At this point, the Aggies took over. A long drive culminating with a Marion Pew pass to Jim Thomason in the left flat gave the Aggies the lead and final score, 7-3. Santa Clara would go on to finish 14th in the country in the final polls. The annual Rose Festival in Tyler marked the sign of the Aggies' fourth game against the Villanova Wildcats. The eyes of the nation's football experts were on the game since both teams were strong contenders for the mythical national championship. Starting the game with a bang, the accurate passing of Pew to Darris Mosier and Herb Smith sent the Aggies into scoring position. Kimbrough led the charge, and the Aggies were on the board with the first score. Pugh would not only throw, he could catch too, intercepting an errant pass to give the Aggies the ball. Pugh back and throws deep. Mosier's the man, caught, touchdown. 52-yard pass and catch. Aggies up, two touchdowns. The play of the game was made by Kanatzer. He took a wildcat punt and returned it 66 yards for the touchdown, eluding eight would-be tacklers along the way. The Aggies recorded their most decisive victory 33 to 7. October 21st, the Aggies began conference play in Fort Worth against defending national champion TCU. TCU took the early lead in the opening minutes. 
but the tough Aggie defense shut them down for the rest of the game. The offense mustered 20 points behind the magnificent play of the A&M lineman. Final score, 20 to six. Having come through their first five games undefeated, the Aggie team found itself stamped as the team in the conference to beat. The Baylor Bears came to College Station to try their luck against the Ags. A few seconds into the game, Herb Smith stripped the ball from the Baylor quarterback and ran 25 yards for the touchdown. The remainder of the first half featured great line play on the part of both teams and a strong Aggie defense when Baylor threatened to score. A third quarter Baylor fumble led to a Kimbrough touchdown run. On play one of quarter four, Mosier dashed 34 yards to start another Aggie scoring march. Kimbrough smashed the line and carried the ball to the two yard line where Mosier went across on a reverse. A&M won this battle of the Brazos 20 to nothing. Fayetteville, Arkansas. The Razorbacks were next on the Aggie schedule. It was the Hogs homecoming game and there was plenty of fireworks on the playing field. A beautiful pass from Jeff Jeffrey to Herb Smith gave A&M its first score. In the second quarter, Rob Nett intercepted a pass and went 30 yards, then lateral to Kimbrough, who went 23 more before being stopped. Conanser then scooted around the right end to score from the seventh. A&M up 14 to nothing. After a few more plays, the Ags were deep in hog territory when a Jeffrey pass to Buck Buchanan was completed. Buchanan, with nowhere to run, decided to lateral the ball to Joe Boyd. Boyd took to running and scored from the eight yard line. 21 to nothing, Aggies. Razorbacks threatened in the third, reaching the three yard line with a first and goal, only to lose five yards over the next four downs and in the drive. The Ags Mosier ran for 38 yards on a beautiful broken field run. Mosier, the playmaker, then threw a perfect 47-yard pass to Kanatzer, who took the ball for what would finish the scoring 27 to nothing. A&M improved to 7-0 and with the win, and they were on a roll. The SMU Mustangs came to College Station with only a one-point loss to Notre Dame on their otherwise unblemished record. Although Kyle Field was rain-drenched, it did not dampen the Aggie spirit. Second quarter action. Tommy Vaughn recovered a fumble on the Mustang nine yard line and the Aggies were knocking on the door. Two times, Kimbrough crashed the line unsuccessfully. But on the third attempt, he faked the plunge and ran to the left side, devastating the opponent's defense, scoring what would prove to be A&M's only score of the day. A&M's defense was up to the task on this afternoon, pursuing the Mustangs all over the field. As time wound down, SMU took to the air only to be picked off by the Aggies. A&M gave up a safety on a block punt in the end zone. The ever alert Conants fell on the ball in the end zone to save the day for A&M. The game ended with SMU flinging the pigskin toward the end zone and A&M's Kimbrough knocking the ball loose from a would-be receiver into the stands, preserving the Aggie victory 6-2. to A&M and the home stretch travel to Houston to take on Rice Institute on November the 18th. The spirit that carried the Aggie team all through the season did not dim, and a sweeping victory was the result. A&M shut out its opponent again while the offense tallied 19 points. A&M scored on a Kimbrough run. Cotton Price passed to Harold Cowley for a 17-yard touchdown play and finished the Rice team off with a fourth quarter Price toss to Bill Knatzer for a 34-yard TD. Final score in Houston, A&M 19, Rice nothing. A&M was undefeated, 
going into the Thanksgiving Day match with the Texas Longhorns. With the conference championship already in hand, the pride of the state was on the line. The annual bonfire, elephant walk, leading up to the annual clash, had everyone on campus ready for the game. In a cold wind and rain, the two teams began the game. Throughout the first half, it was a hard, muddy, spirited battle with neither team catching a break, leaving the first half scoreless. After the Aggie band finished its Turkey Day performance, the second half began with a bang. Coach Norton called what would become known only as the hideout play. He had Bama Smith literally hide out on the west sideline and on the first play from scrimmage, Price completed a long pass to Smith who was wide open for a huge game. With the Longhorns still reeling, the Aggies passed their way into the end zone. Price to Jim Sterling for the first score of the game. A&M's next drive. Price passes to Herb Smith, who made a leaping grab and carried the ball down to the Texas four-yard line. On the next play, Conanser slashed off tackle for the score. Aggies up by two touchdowns. Fourth quarter action. The Farmers took the ball on the Texas 15, went to work from the short field. Kimbrough drove over the middle for A&M's final score of the day. Varsity's horns sawed off. Texas A&M 20, Texas nothing. A&M finished the season undefeated and accepted a bowl invitation to play Tulane in the Sugar Bowl in New Orleans. The bowl game would prove to be another great battle for the Aggies with memorable plays that will be etched into Aggie lore to this day. A&M's Kimbrough scored first in the New Year's Day contest on a two-yard run to give the Maroon and White a 7 to nothing lead. The lead would last until halftime when an A&M kick was returned by Tulane's Bob Kellogg for a 76-yard touchdown, nodding the score at 7. A&M began to drive the ball again when a Mosier lateral fell into the hands of Tulane defenders. <laughs> Tulane then drove the ball 30 yards for the score. The extra point attempt was blocked by Herb Smith what would be one of the defining plays of the game. Fourth quarter, A&M put together a championship drive, passing and running their way down to the 26-yard line of Tulane. The famous hook and ladder came next. Cotton Price passed the ball to Herb Smith, who took the pass, then lateral to Jaron John Kimbrough at the 15-yard line, who carried it into the end zone, outrunning three Tulane defenders for the score. Game tied at 13 with the extra point to go. Cotton Price put the ball through the uprights for the go-ahead score, 14 to 13. The Aggie defense held tight, forcing another Tulane punt. A&M drove the field, using up clock and Tulane's hopes. They finished the game on the Tulane five. With A&M's unblemished record, 11-0, the Farmers finished atop the final polls in the land as the nation's best team of 1939. Their defense dominated opponents, setting records for excellence that stand to this day. They ranked number one in total defense for the NCAA for the season, allowing only 76.3 yards per game, number one in scoring defense, and number one in rush defense. They set the NCAA record at 1.7 yards per play allowed for a season, a national record that stands to this day. The Southwest Conference closed its record books with 1939 defense still garnering several records for total defense never to be broken. The team was more importantly made up of a group of men that embodied the ideals of team, pride in school, and country, bringing forth the spirit of competitiveness on the gridiron that endeared themselves to the state and the nation.
1939's Texas Aggie football team, pride of Aggieland, national champions. In 1998, Texas A&M honored the 1939 team by presenting them with national championship rings at a pregame ceremony at G. Raleigh White Coliseum. Surviving members of the championship squad were given a standing ovation by the sold-out Kyle Field crowd at halftime of the A&M game against Nebraska. Another great moment for the team of the century. Of course, you stand out in your mind with it. You played in the Sugar Bowl, and your opponents only got in this conference only got 18 points for the whole season, and no team averaged over 70 yards running against us. And if we missed them in the line, we had linebackers that were just terrific. You could hear that leather pop. It crucified those guys when they stuck their heads through that line. I tell you, John Kimbrough was a man, he was a horse. Man, he was something. He had one right leg one day, about twice as big as the other one. They had so much water in it. And uh, right before the ball game, I went out in the dressing room, of course, and there he was. And, he was putting masonite, a masonite splint, not on the bad leg, but on the good leg. I said, John, you put it on the wrong leg. Put it on the other one. The bad leg said, no, sir. And they'll stomp it all afternoon. He said, I'm going to put it on this and let them stomp on that one for a while and I'll get by. He did. <laughs> he, said, he was that kind of a football player. In those days, we were just uh, country boys, most of us. And, uh, didn't ha we didn't have a dime to our name, but we were determined to get our sophomore year. We had good players, but we, we, we couldn't get them together, and we didn't do good. We, we made a, got together at the start of the 39 year and said, we're, we're going to go somewhere. A&M hadn't won a conference in, oh, I don't know how many years. And we not only won the conference, we won the national title. And it's the only uh, title that A&M's won in, uh, in football. You don't do anything by yourself. You got to have help. I had uh, 10 other boys helping me. And uh, just like Tommy Vaughn said, I didn't gain an inch if he didn't hand me the ball. No face guards. Your face was wide open. I don't want to tell you was playing against SMU. And they sent a guy in against me. It was a muddy day. And he was built like a bale of cotton. And uh, you know what I mean? He wasn't very tall. And when he snapped the ball, he slugged me right in the mouth, busted both lips, loosened my teeth. And the referee hollered, you can't do that. And I said, look, Jimmy, he's already done it. Look at my mouth, man. I was just squirting blood, you know. But they penalized him half this to the goal. We scored. And we beat him six and two to go on to an undefeated season. So somebody has to suffer a little bit for anything that's good, you know. Uh, it was really one of those things, you know.